Hey, welcome to River Centurion Online. We are so glad that you've joined us. We trust that today's message is gonna help you, that it's gonna build into your life, that it'll equip you, and it'll help you to draw closer to God. Enjoy. This is River Centurion. We were never a building, and this was never a space made of brick and mortar, but this is home. Now our home meets in yours. Hi church, uh, wonderful to be with you on this Valentine's Day. And before we get into Valentine's Day, I just want to thank you especially for your giving, for your generosity and for your commitment to building the house. We don't take it for granted. We appreciate it. And our church is strong. We're able to look after our staff. And so I just wanted to take a special opportunity to thank you. Now today is Valentine's Day, the day of love. And Pastor Wilma and I have been married for 40 years eight years. I can't hardly believe that I'm actually saying it. And so I want to take the opportunity, babe, to wish you a happy Valentine's Day, but a happy anniversary. Still love you like I did when we met. And I've got something for you today that I want to bless you with. And uh, happy anniversary. We'll put them aside and uh, keep them out the way so we can see each other. And uh, good to have you back, Nats, after feeding the baby. <laughs> and uh, we've got couples with us today that are on staff, a whole range of couples. Uh, we've got uh, Cameron and Kelsey, married less than two months. Congratulations. And uh, Pastor Dev and Nats, married for 10 years. You're the longest. And uh, Keenan and Whitney had a baby during lockdown. Amazing. And that should be an interesting experience. But most of all is the couple who got married and then went straight into lockdown. <laughs> Stephen and Rachel have been on honeymoon since lockdown. <laughs> they are thanking God for lockdown. Oh. And their parents are asking, where the children? <laughs> but great to have so many wonderful couples with us. We believe in marriage. We value relationships. And so today we are going to talk about relationships. Come, let's pray and let's get to the word today. Father, we thank you for this time that we can come together and do this on this uh, special day, making a focus on love. You're the author of love. We pray that what we do would glorify you, would help people. Uh, it wouldn't be frivolous or a uh, novel, but that families and individuals across our campuses would benefit, would be instructed, and would be inspired to improve uh, all their relationships, especially those long-standing ones, marriages. We just commit this time to you. Pray for your anointing on everything we say. In Jesus' name, amen. God is a God of relationships. And in the book of Genesis, it says of the Trinity, the three in one, let us make man in our image. So when God made man and woman, he made them for relationships because the Trinity is a Godhead of relationships. And God intended for us to firstly to have friendships, non-romantic, long-lasting, committed, same-sex friendships, or even with the opposite sex, friendships that are not romantic in any way. And we're not getting it right. We're messing it up. We're getting confused about who we are. When we get close to people, we think it has to be sexual. Then God also created us for singleness. He created us for a relationship, but some people are meant to be single. Jesus and Paul were single and they were whole. There was nothing dysfunctional about them. So if you're single today, don't feel, oh, it's Valentine's Day. I don't have anybody. What's wrong with me? Here I am alone. No, no, no. God created you whole. Yeah. 
And if there's no partner for you or you feel quite happy alone, that's okay. And then God created marriage. We start off dating, romantic attachment, but then it's meant to go into marriage. And what initiates these relationships is not what sustains them. Yeah. Marriages don't just last on feelings. The Valentine's Day are the feelings, but then marriages last. Ours, 48 years so far, I can hardly believe that, but they've lasted because there've been things that we've used to sustain our marriage. And so we're going to talk today about that. And I want to say at the outset that many Christians are under the wrong impression. They think that you've got to, if your marriage is going to work, you've got to meet the right person. You know, Pastor Andre, Andre and Wilma, they met the right people, you know, and she's the right one for him. No, you become the right one. And there's not just one person for you. We're attracted to many people. And in the Bible, those who God led to marry a specific person are the exception, not the rule. So we're going to discuss today the initiators and sustainers of marriage. Because Valentine's Day is really the day, if you like, where you initiate, I think I like you, oh, I like you too. And the feelings are there and there's roses and flowers and it's, it's just that wonderful thing when you're dating. But what makes it last? Because clearly marriages are not lasting and people are going from person to person looking for something they'll never find because you're meant to create it. So we've got a number of things that we're going to discuss today. And um, on Valentine's Day, if you like, the, one of the initiators that starts people getting, you know, meeting each other is there's attraction. Uh, the Bible talks about being attracted to someone. In Deuteronomy 29, if, you, if a man sees a woman and he's attracted to her. So clearly we are attracted by sight. In the book of Ezekiel, women were attracted to men and sought after them. So it works both ways. So attraction is what brings people together. It's a natural, spontaneous thing. But what sustains marriage is unconditional love. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that a bit, babe, and just explain that a bit? Because the one's natural and the other one requires work. And we've seen that in our own marriage. Yeah, so... You know, whenever we think of love, I go straight to Song of Songs and it's just the book of love and it's everything pretty and beautiful. There's edibles, there's oil for anointing, there's fragrance, there's perfume and it's all the outward things and it's pretty probably pretty soulish if you if you can think think about it is, what it, it is. And it it's, is R thirteen. And and also it's it's all about it's all about atmosphere if you think about it as well you know um, atmosphere around um, Valentine's or a date or a special occasion um, it's it's about the roses it's about the candles it's about the lighting and and that's all all wonderful and I mean even in in um, in Proverbs, it speaks about being intoxicated with love. And in Song of Songs, it speaks about my love, my dove. And it's very poetic and it's very beautiful. And it starts there. But actually, it's the agape love. So it's the eros that starts this thing going. And it's the attraction because it's attraction is a God-given thing. It's a blessing. Um, and then the unconditional love, the agape, is the god kind of love where um, you know you you have to get through this familiarity thing that comes into a marriage there is familiarity that can breed contempt even in a marriage and uh, there's the aging and you're not the person you used to be but honestly you know and I'm the wife of your youth right Malachi chapter 2 that's correct but the agape love the God quality kind of love that is what is going to sustain a marriage. It's the forgiveness. It's the overlooking. And if if you can't overlook any further, then sh there should be communication. Because God is a God of communication. He's the one who said to Israel um, in the book of Isaiah when they were unreasonable. He and and he couldn't get through to them. He couldn't speak to them and make sense to them. He said, you know, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will make it as white as snow. And so communication for us as a couple, um, we don't like sweeping things under the carpet. We, Even if it's foolish and it's ridiculous and it's a woman with a dog with a bone, apparently, I can be a dog with a bone person. I don't let it go until it settles. And that takes communication. It takes patience. And that is where unconditional love 
comes in. So if you think about it, you know, people ask, well, how did you get this far? You know, 48 years, unconditional love. It's the love of God, which is the decision. We've gone way beyond the feeling of romance and attraction into that agape love, which then restores romantic love if you practice it. So initiators are very different to sustainers. The second one, and we, there are quite a few here, is in the beginning you feel a chemistry with the person, eros, the desire. Ooh, I like you. Ooh, I like you too. And that's wonderful. It's God-given. But the Bible uses different words for love, and one of them is eros, desire, sexual desire, attraction, physical desire. It's not wrong, but you can't sustain a marriage on that. You, you, need, you, need more than, uh, um, you need more than that chemistry. You need companionship. And so you go from naturally being wanting to be with each other to deciding to be with each other. Absolutely. Do you want to chat a bit about that, babe? Yes. Is that companionship? Um, it goes into friendship, which we'll talk a bit about later. Yeah. But, but it goes, actually goes from eros to what the Bible calls philia. 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 Friendship love. Yeah. Um, and, and that is also something that has sustained us as a couple for 48 years. We, we always remember that we are romantically linked um, we are purpose driven. We got married. We ran business. Uh, we had children. We went into the ministry. We are a team, but we are best friends. And if there's anything that I need, if I can't share with my husband the things that I can share with my girlfriends, then something is wrong. And the the girlfriend thing is wonderful. And we do need one another. We do need girlfriends. And there are a few silly little things that you're going to speak about. I've got an ingrown toenail or, you know. You know, my nail broke while I was doing one thing or the other. Those are friendship little girlfriend things. But the deep things, the things that you're concerned about, your your soul, your spirit, your health, mm. those are the, the, I feel safe when I can run into my husband's arms and tell him that I think something's wrong with my health. And then he can calm me and he can lay hands on me immediately and pray for me. And I think that is what has sustained um our marriage and all marriages, I think, is based on companionship and friendship. Yeah, you do things together. Um, and I'm sure those of you on the stands here would agree. Uh, you, you know, you, you, if a friend says to you, I need to go shopping at Macro, you go with them. And you talk for an hour about soccer. If you guys, you'll talk about soccer and you'll talk about the country and you'll talk about church or whatever. But if your wife says, I need to go shopping at Macro, it's like... <sighs> It's like you want to die. Why? It's a mental block. You should be friends with your wife and chat to her while shopping. Now, it might be a bit harder because she's looking at nappies or she's looking, you know. But that's, you see, it, it takes work to build a that's marriage. Right. Whereas yeah. Valentine's is just natural because there's chemistry. And we must understand that if we're going to build lasting relationships. It's not yeah. a grind. Yeah. It's just a different approach. Yeah. The third one is when you, when you meet, and all of you would probably agree, they're common interests. And, you know, you sit down, you talk about music and, you know, there's that, I don't believe it. Do you like that also? Uh, do you like Taylor Swift? I can't believe it. You know, and, and silly stuff that, you know, that color and that kind of food and whatever it is. And, and at the time of meeting, there's like these common interests. But what happens is you've got to, if you're going to go into a marriage, the, what happens is your tastes and your interests change. So you've got to learn, and I've, and I've put it down here as differing interests because tastes change over time. Your music taste change. Um, Vilma's music taste change. I still like some rock music. I listen to a lot of Christian rock. 12 Stones is a good band, if you like, P.O.D. Um, she doesn't like that. We can't play it in the house because there's differing tastes. But our marriage has not fallen apart because of it. No, no. And you have to adjust instead of rejecting the person. You know what a lot of couples do? You're not who I married. Obviously. <laughs> Gosh, people change. Life moves on. But if you want to sustain it, there's Absolutely. got to be that. And if you want to touch on that for a moment. Yeah, interestingly, I, I never liked motor car racing, but because Andre liked motor car racing, I was very keen on motor car racing. I never liked soccer, but because he liked soccer, I was like, wow, who's that player and who's that player? Um, some music, Black Sabbath. I did enjoy Jess Rota. I didn't like Black Sabbath, but he some found out. Some he, of it we left out. behind. He, he, he found out. He found out how willing I was to 
to bend in she a way, was. to lean in and and she be was. interested because he's my boyfriend and, and, and I was willing to like those things. But honestly, once the children came and once feeding came and washing nappies came, because we didn't have disposables in those days, you do not want to hear Uriah Heep or Black Sabbath pounding through the house, you know. <laughs> But there are differing interests and tastes over time. Um, I think we almost had a car accident once talking about f the furniture we were going to buy. And suddenly Pastor Andre was going from being a Tuscan fan to a modern fan. And I'm left behind in, in Tuscany. <laughs> and um, he nearly turned in front of a car because it, was, it caused such a thing in the car because, like, what's happened to you? I've changed. There was tension I've changed. in that car. I like modern. <laughs> there was tension because he suddenly became modern. And then, you know what? Suddenly he sort of bounced back and he became Tuscan again. So, differing interests and taste over time, certainly. I, I just think it's all about teamwork and understanding and... And adjusting. Bearing with one another and, and, and going through the seasons of life. We, we all have to face seasons of life. There's mm. no ways... The teen, late teens we were when we got married in 1973 can be the people that we were, that we are now, I beg mm. your pardon. So there's no ways we're going to like the same music or even the same taste in clothing or anything like that. And that is the leaning in towards each other that I've taught the ladies that we're going to talk about later in the month as we continue in the month of love at Sisters. But it's that leaning in and it's that just that it's not bending over but it's blending, rather. It's blending and agreeing mm. and um, you know I think it's for the sake of peace as well and and I think sometimes it's where the fruit of the Holy Spirit comes in where you actually you you lay down and your stubbornness and you lay down your what you think is is to be done and you soon soon realize that that attitude is what will sustain your marriage and that is you know in a month's time you're going to forget this disagreement in a month's time you're not going to even remember it because life moves on very very quickly and you are still together and you still have purpose and focus for your life and your mm, marriage mm, very good see a lot of these things they they're almost natural now Mm. And you kind of think you're going to ride on that. But those of you, you've been married a short time even, you'd know. This wears off quickly. And the reality of the toughness of life comes in. And, and another area today is, is you know, when there's, when there's romance, like today, it's a day of romance. When you first meet each other and you're dating, romance, it's like a spark. It's, it's spontaneous. But when, when a marriage goes on, when you get married, you have to plan that romance. It doesn't just happen. You don't just look at each other and go, oh. You have to plan to spend time together, plan romantic times so rather than it being spontaneous and being a feeling it becomes work and we've had to set times aside to be together to go out make our anniversary special and uh, and to have time alone in the busy schedule of our lives that's how you sustain a relationship you can't live with what initiates it yeah. then also one of the things that people make a mistake with is when they get married we're Christians because we have what's called a common faith but what we actually need to sustain our relationship is not just, it's not enough to say, well, we're both Christians, it'll work. Many Christians get divorced. We have to, we, what, you, what you need to sustain a marriage is a common level of maturity in the faith. Because if one grows faster than the other, or one decides not to grow, the marriage will disintegrate because one is very committed, tithing, serving. The other one is, well, I'm, I'm barely into heaven as long as my ticket's clipped. I gave my life to Jesus when I was in high school. No, no, there has to be a growth together in the things of God and in commitment, then the marriage will be strong. And that doesn't just happen. It's a decision. Yeah, absolutely. It's in our early a years, hunger, uh, a hunger for God, yes. Yes, in our early years, that was something that nearly separated us because Vilma grew more rapidly than I did. She wanted to be in everything at all church meetings with everybody, and I didn't. I was a bit more quieter. If we went to church once a week, I've had my church. I read the Bible, but I wasn't, and it could have separated our marriage. It could have, and it was so beautiful because that's why I just love the body of Christ. Don't you love the body of Christ? Mm. Um, someone had a dream, um, like prophetically, a friend who didn't make a big thing of it, just came to me quietly and took me aside and said, God gave me a dream about Andre, and um, it's, 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 it's very simple. He's going to overtake you. He's going to overtake you spiritually, and uh, you're going to learn from him, and he's going to amaze many people 
in this church. And that dream came true. And he overtook me to the point where I have to run to him to ask him, where's this scripture? And where does it? I asked him before, before the recording, I asked you, who was the son of David who, who did something inappropriate to his stepsister? And it's that kind of relationship now. And obviously, I bounce everything off him. But the beauty is we grew together spiritually and I also allowed for him to grow ahead of me spiritually. It doesn't just happen. You have to work on it together. And wives, if your husband's not growing at the same speed as you, don't go to the pastor and nag him and report your husband. Spend time That's with your right. husband, talk to him and discuss it together and don't make him feel inferior. Yeah. It's something that has to be worked on. It doesn't just happen. We don't just grow into our potential Absolutely. in business, neither spiritually. Yeah. So it, it requires yeah. work if you want your marriage to last because otherwise it can end up being broken up and it often happens that the weaker one ends up being tempted compromises values whereas the stronger one is so committed to Christ that nothing can shake them so if you want your marriage to last do you remember the tip that we give to people who struggle with a spouse that's lost interest because I remember there was a time when I just got quite cold not co I would say not cold, cold, but I cooled off in my commitment in terms of reading the word and spending time in prayer. And Pastor Andre said to me, uh, it's many years ago, he, he just said to me, um, I've noticed you don't read as much as you used to. And, you know, it's always walking on you and you're on your knees praying in the bedroom. And I don't see that anymore. And um, <clears throat> it, it was no use him telling me. What he did then is he said to me, um, I prayed for you while you were sleeping. And that's what we do for each other. We lay hands on each other. If I'm concerned about his health or concerned about something that's worrying him, uh, while he's sleeping, I lay hands on him and he does the same for me. And if I suddenly begin to see a breakthrough in my life, I know he's prayed for me. I just, I was like, hey, did you, did you pray for me? And he says, yes, I prayed for you. So that's just a good tip. That's the thing that we have as Christians. It's wonderful. It's, we don't have to go to self-help books and things that don't relate to heaven or the kingdom of God. Is We have everything we need that God has blessed us with. And one of them is we can lay hands on each other and we can pray for each other. I'm glad you raised that because I want to encourage all of you here and those of you watching that you need to pray for your partner. If your partner is being moody, uh, if they're struggling with their health, their weight, all these things, you take it to God in prayer because you're responsible for that person. And uh, you, are, you are one. No one hates their own flesh, it says in Ephesians. So you take your flesh to God like you would pray for yourself and watch God do amazing things. Don't rely on that spontane sp spontaneity from Valentine's Day. It's not enough. You have to pray and you'll see God change your partner. Then to get through all these, because they're so important, you know, when you first meet, you, you're committed. But what you have to do in order to sustain a relationship is enter a covenant. Because when you're dating, you're committed. Yeah, yeah, we're going out. We're engaged. There's a ring. But actually, it doesn't exclude everybody. And there is the option of breaking it off, which in many people's minds, they keep it open. And many people have called off engagements. In fact, I want to say this. If you're dating and you're dating for like two, three, four, five years, something is wrong. Because you're not commit, you, you, you've lost the commitment that you had in the beginning, but now you won't make covenant. That's why you won't get married. Now, I might be putting someone under pressure. You can write me an email and you can say, Pastor Andre, you put me on the spot. But seriously, relationships are important and another person's life is valuable. And either we need to enter covenant or release a person. But covenant requires work and it requires commitment and sacrifice. And um, in, in the beginning, when you first meet someone, there's that, I love you. Yes, I love you too. Yes, let's go out. Oh, I'm looking, looking forward. Your friends will ask you, has he proposed? You know, and I'm waiting. And, and you're hovering there. But when you get into marriage, you, you, you've joined together. And this is what people say. It's not the piece of paper. I'm going to contradict you. It is the piece of paper. It's not the piece of paper that keeps you together. But a piece of paper gives you peace of mind. It gives you an assurance that the person cares. And so we need to show, I'm committed to you, not just by tongue in the season, but I'm committed to you and will go the journey with you. And I think people are, they've got commitment when they're dating and they, you know, uh, yes, you know, uh, you're my only girlfriend, my only boyfriend. 
But covenant is somewhat different. It's the sharing of lives. Do you want to comment on that, babe? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we see in the book of Joshua, chapter 9, verse 14, where there is a situation where, um, you know, people, the Gibeonites, came and joined with the people of God, with Israel. And they came under false pretenses. They, they said, we've traveled for so many days and so many miles. And, you know, our shoes are worn out. And, you know, our bread has gone old and moldy. And, you know, they came with... Um, uh, with with a, a false report and they were completely, they had an agenda and they were just people from around the corner. And because Joshua did not seek the Lord about the situation, mm. he kind of made a covenant with these people. And once he had done that, um, it, it was then too late to break covenant. Mm. And marriage is, is very, very much like that. Not not in this not in the context of being having an agenda or being false or anything. The the point is what what a covenant is, it's a very serious thing in the eyes of God. Mm. And God made a covenant with his people and Jesus in the New Testament made a covenant with the Gentiles and with us to be born again and to be saved. So a covenant is something um, that you work on. It's binding. It's important. You've made your bed. Now you've got to lie on it. You, mm. you, you know, you have to, like for us as a couple and for many, many thousands of couples who have made this covenant, for them there is no, no, no thought at all ever about separating and getting divorced. They work things out. Now, having said that, I must say, there are extenuating circumstances for why people, even pastors, uh, don't stay together because there are other factors involved. But if it's a normal life that you're leading every day and you have now... Um, had your kids and you know you're still planning more you you've had your children they married or you still have a covenant with your spouse you mm. can't just decide I think I got married too young we've got all the excuses in all the world mm. Mm. we have all the excuses for why a marriage like ours should never have lost in fact we were talking about the fact that my brother who walked me down the aisle he wanted to get married and he did get get married in the same year and he um, walked me down the aisle and down the aisle, he wasn't born again. He gave his heart to the Lord before he passed away several years ago. But he was like, you've really messed everything up, haven't you? You know, and, um, and like, let's see how long this is going to last. And then Pastor Andre's sister and brother-in-law at the time was, we, we're just holding thumbs for you guys because you're kids. What do you know? You're not. And I'm sad to say, you know, I mean, you know, for, for, for my brother particularly, his marriage didn't last and um, his second marriage didn't last. And the two of us have just carried on, not because we're great people, or we're better people, or we, we're fantastic, we superstars, or anything like that. It's because of who was in the center of our lives. That's it, who was that third cord That's it. tied together, that, yes. that covenant that we made with God and one another, um, that this is for life, and this is how it's going to be. And uh, it, we get over ourselves if we get to a place. I, I know that yesterday, I wasn't on speaking terms with this man for about really? two hours and like you know and you snap out of it like that you know you snap out of it and that's what I have to do come on it's not worth it time is short and especially now I just want to say this during this pandemic let's not fool around um, with feelings and no communication and sulking and I'm not going to ever forgive you or you know I'm going out for the night I'm spending a night somewhere else or whatever let's just pull together at this time because the enemy is going around like a roaring lion and let's not give him any any reason Amen. Have I gone off the point there? No, no, you haven't gone off the point. Yeah. In fact, I want to pick up from what Vilma said. She spoke about the Gibeonites and how they deceived Joshua. When he found out he had been deceived, that they were actually the people of the land that he should have killed, he didn't say, oh, you crooked me. Now I've seen the truth. And so the covenant is void. That's what a lot of people do. Now that I've been married five years, I found out the real person you are and you're not the person I thought you were. And so I've got a right to get divorced. No, you don't. You're in a covenant. And what you need to do is what Joshua didn't do. He sought the Lord before the time. You do everything before the time. You search, you look. You, you, uh, dating is not a time for mating. It's a time for gathering data and finding out about a person and, and checking up on them. And then you commit and you stay in covenant and nothing tears you apart. 
That's how God's covenant is with us. He's chosen us. He's saved us. We belong to him. And nothing that we do or say could take us away from him. And so we need to build that covenant. And a covenant is a sharing of lives, sharing of everything. And um, I think what happens when, when you meet is there's so much spark going on that you can lose sight of this amount of work that's required. Uh, another area, and we, we need to do this for the sake of time, is when you, when you meet, there's similar values and that's what brings you together. Oh, there's similarities, there's differences. You, you actually overlook the differences, but the similarities are like almost inspiring. But what, 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 what has to happen is you can't just have shared interests. You need similar values. In fact, the same values, shared values. So from similar interests to shared values, shared values are much different to interest. Interests are things that don't matter. Clothing, food, furniture. It's, not, it's actually not that important, but values are. Because values are biblical and they have to do with morality, to do with what God says is right or wrong. And if you don't have the same values, your marriage won't survive. Yeah. And so in terms of values, especially things around money, you've got to have the same shared value that we need to tithe, give offerings, shared values around raising children, Correct. shared values around purity, morality, sexuality. Um, all those things need to be uh, clear. Amos 3.3 3 says, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? So that's not just agreeing about furniture and tastes in carpets. It's about agreeing on values. And that's what keeps a church strong, yeah. keeps a marriage strong. Yeah. And you have to work at that and discuss those things. Uh, then what happens when you initiate a relationship is you present your best. And you know, as they say on Instagram, present the best and hide the rest. We all present our best when we're dating. Isn't that true? Yes. We dress up, we do our makeup and wear the best clothes, look in the mirror, do all sorts, go out, how do I look? But what happens is when you get older, you've got to overlook the worst in your partner. Because when you are presenting the best, that's dating. But when you're married, it's overlooking the worst. And you'll see the worst in people, things you didn't know. We've had to do that throughout our lives, look at things in each other that we don't like because familiarity creeps in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I have to say that this is the side that takes work. Um, we're talking about that which comes naturally and that is the side we're talking about now which takes work. And, um, you know, I, I recently uh, came to a place where I needed a new vision and a new interest. And so I, I found a new interest that's not distracting me from my family or my work or even taking me out of the house. I just found something that I'm enjoying and it's given me like a new lease of life. And um, I, 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 it has to do with my appearance and it has to do with how I present myself. And um, because I think we all just got into such a rut during this lockdown, especially if you're working from home. I think it might be different for you if you're not working from home. You have to be out and how you dress and present yourself and so forth. And um, I, I just feel we all have to work at it. We have to say, look, you know, when I was young, he liked my hair long, but now I can't stand it anymore. This heat's driving me mad or, you know, it's too much work. I'm just going to chop it all off now. Bless you if that's what you've done and it's working for you. It's not going to work for me uh, in this marriage. It, it certainly isn't. So I, I think that all of us, no matter what it is, for one person, it's something to do with their weight. Another person, something to do with what they wear. Another person, it, I, I don't know, it may be as something to do with what they're cooking because I believe that um, I have to even in the kitchen present something that that's not what I want but what my family will enjoy and what I know my husband will love so everything of this nature um, we can't just throw things on the plate and just let it let it all just you know happen and keep the family happy and keep the marriage going it just doesn't work that way all of this takes a lot of work your health your weight, mm. your exercise, your be nice to be near. I think we all need to work on how to be nice to be near. Uh, and that means we keep ourselves fresh. We wash our hair. Uh, we wear deodorant. We, um, we watch what we eat. It's all those things that seem like the outward things. But let's be honest, it started there. Right, it started there, and the spiritual is very important. It's very important in our relationship, but really, it really does take a lot of work 
and a lot of sacrificing I in the marriage. Does. I think it does. I, I've often said this, um, women complain, uh, my husband's lost interest. Well, if, if when he met you, you were this gorgeous girl and you know, we change, you have, you have children, it's fully understandable, you change, you put on weight, but no man wants to be married to his mother, especially when he's 40. You want your girlfriend, you want, and your body changes, our bodies change, we put on weight, your stomach muscles relax, all that stuff unfortunately happens, hair comes out of your ears, disappears off your head, all these horrible things that happen. And, but yet we've got to make sure that we, that we overlook each other's faults. But at the same time, I think there's, there's, there's work. And, and I think what it is, is in the beginning, you, you're willing to share mm. in a marriage. And like when you're dating, you share, uh, I'll do that for you. I'll give this for you. But actually what happens when you, when you're married a long time, you have to sacrifice. You have to actually sacrifice. I, I think what you're talking about is very important. Even during lockdown, you know, you can, you can, you can wear a shirt for three days because you don't have to go anywhere. You, you, you know, well, I don't have to shave because I'm not going on TV. I'm not going out to church. I'm not going to be seeing people. I'm going to the office. I still try every now and again. I mean, I grew a beard for a bit, but I try and at least, not, you know, not, not stop shaving and look like a hobo. Um, use deodorant, use um, perfume. I walk into the kitchen, boss says, hmm, what's that? Oh, that's John Paul Gautier. I got that for my birthday uh, from one of the staff. And um, so you try because you can share when you're dating, but actually you need to sacrifice. Yeah. And you need to, you present the best when you're dating, but you should, you should really overlook the worst and present the best again when you want it to last. The last one here, and obviously we could talk endlessly about this. I don't know how long we've been speaking, but I gather it's time for us to probably wrap up, but I hope this has been helping you. This is probably the subject that most marriages run into trouble. But when you're dating, because there's attraction and desire, and then when you get married, sex is spontaneous. You want to have sex and it comes naturally. Any opportunity you can get, especially before the kids come along, and I won't look at any of the couples in the stands. We, it's the wonder that God has created. It's a gift of God. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a gift of God. In marriage, the most beautiful, exciting thing. However, for a marriage to be sustained, sex is not spontaneous. Sex needs to be planned. You say, what? Yep. You have to find time. You have to decide. That's why in many, many Christian marriages, they are sexless marriages because no one planned. They got so busy working, so busy doing their jobs. They're tired by the, by the evening. I'm tired. You know, I'm not the young person I used to be. No, you actually have to decide and talk and plan. You, you might say, well, if you plan it, how boring is that? I mean, that's like duty. No, it then leads to the spark of romance, the spark of love coming back when you put the work in. And if you want to comment on that, babe, because it's, it, yeah. you know, we touched on that at a family conference once, yeah. sexless marriages, and so many people could relate to it. They say yeah. after five years, you know, the marriage is sexless, and then that leads to temptation, that leads to breakdown. Yeah. Well, they talk about young love, and, you know, when you're young and you've got the energy and the hormones are this way, when you get older, the hormones are that way. And um, I think that... It has to be planned and it. Love has to be kept alive, just like hope has to be kept alive. Mm, very good. And, um, you know, there are resources um, available um, for Christian couples to read on, on how to do that. And um, we can't just allow life to overtake us and forget what this is all about and you, you you know for some couples it feels like and what they've even said to me I don't know in counseling settings that any of you have been in but you know I feel like I'm married to my brother or I feel like I'm married to my sister because I might as well we might as well have our own rooms and you know we just eat together and you know there's nothing happening well the thing is there has to be again an initiation and um, we were taught by our senior pastors when we were young that foreplay is very important and foreplay starts in the morning. So it can start by just the look that you give one another, you're sending a signal, it's suddenly breakfast in bed, what got into you? You know, I always just slap my own eggs into the pan myself or I just have some oats so easy or whatever it is. It's, it's that effort. It's We are talking about that which is the natural side and that which takes work. And this is, it takes work. You've got to keep romance alive. You've mm. got to, husbands, go past a shop and buy your wife 
some flowers, if, if, if it's, even if it's not the red roses, which is very scarce when it comes to Valentine's Day. But just go and get a beautiful plant, get yeah, something yeah. and come home with it behind your back and surprise her and do the things you used to do. We actually call each other boyfriend and girlfriend because we don't want to forget the things that were important to us at the beginning of our relationship yeah. that has kept us for, for all of this time. I think light candles... When he comes home and there's candles lit, or when she comes home, there are candles lit. Um, there's room spray, there's petals, there's all the things you can do. You don't need to go to Mauritius, to Les Two's Rock, or to another hotel room to experience the atmosphere. You create the atmosphere. You decide how your house is going to smell, how your bed is going to look, um, how the flowers are going to be arranged, the music in the background that you're going to play. And I think, excuse the pun, play, the music that's going to play, play. Play. Play along and enjoy and escape. I think during lockdown, this is the most ideal time to escape. No one's coming knocking on the door. What is your excuse, people? Yeah. So it takes, it really, it can be, it can be spontaneous, still at even our age, just to say that. I'll throw that out to you very gently, uh, not to make anyone else feel bad at our age, but it does take still work. Young people, and you so. have to, yeah, we discovered we're actually still young. So you can tell them what, when are you actually old? 65 to 75 is mature. 75 to 85 is old. <laughs> 85 to 95 is very old. So we are just mature. Yeah. Because when you call yourself old, you start to be old. That's right. And don't become old at 40. Yeah. When kids come along, responsibilities come along, keep it alive. I want to say this. When you start a relationship, especially a romantic one, eros is there. Yes. The God, uh, the, the, the romantic love, the spark, the desire, the God-given but you've got to build friendship, philia, and you've got to build agape. Yeah. And as you build those, you go from a romantic relationship into a very strong, mature relationship. And that's what sustains and keeps it going. And it will last. You start with personality, but you end with character. character. And your personality is on display when you meet each other. Your personality is what draws each other and your physical appearance. But character is what will sustain it and that commitment in Christ. And it can be wonderful, not just enduring until Jesus comes. It can be a most wonderful thing. Well, I hope it's been help. Thank you for the team joining us today and just for us sharing with you as couples. We hope that uh, God will put his hand on your life. Pray for restoration. If there's a breakdown, ask God to renew. He's the God of renewal. He's the God of restoration. It's never too late. Our relationship with him was broken down, but he gave his son. And that restored. And so when you give of yourself, that's what restores relationships. You say, well, ours is too far gone. No, Jesus came. Not only did he love us, but he gave himself. Ephesians 5 says, husbands, give yourselves up as Christ gave himself up for the church. So if you want your marriage to work, give yourself sacrificially and then restoration will take place. If you don't know Jesus today, well, he gave himself for you. He gave unconditional love. He was not only attracted to you because you were his creation, God's creation, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But when he saw you in your sin and in your weakness, he didn't just come because he was attracted. He came out of the love of God, the unconditional love of God, and gave himself up on the cross. Why? To restore a relationship with you. Jesus didn't just come to teach so that we might be wise and have another religion with a whole lot of things that we could learn. No, no, no. It was about reconciliation in our relationship with God. And if you have not got that, you can make right with God today by receiving Jesus, who is the mediator between us and our Father. Why not pray with me today and restore your relationship on this Valentine's Day? The love of God is the most important love that we need to have in our lives. So pray with me. And if you've never received Jesus into your life or you've lapsed your relationship, pray this prayer with me. I'll bring it up on the screen for your convenience. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for your son, Jesus, who showed what God's love was really like. I thank you for that love and I receive that love today and I make Jesus Christ my personal Lord and Savior. Come into my life, restore my relationship with the Father, Lord, and bring me to that place where I know you and walk with you 
and experience the love of God. Make me a child of God. I give you my heart today. And I thank you, Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A simple prayer. And as you can see, the QR code on the screen, you can click on that. It'll help you go on a journey of faith. You can also click on the uh, salvation button on our website. Helps you to walk with God. And we'd love you to make a journey with the Father because that's the most important relationship. And then from that, you find it bleeds into all other relationships in your life. The Bible gives you the right perspective on every relationship. Relationship with people in general, relationships as a single, relationships romantically, friendships, and then obviously marriage. Well, Sisters is going to continue with some special stuff. I don't know if you want to mention that yes. quickly. Yes, so on the 26th of February is Sisters Night. It's the month of love. We're going to continue along a similar vein and uh, we, we're going to discuss relationships as well, singleness and romantic love. Wonderful. So we look forward to And you're going to you. join me, right? I am going to yes. join you. We're going to do some fresh stuff on that uh, that night. So we look forward to seeing all the girls on that night and the guys, if they want to tune in as well, get a man's perspective as well. But I just want to leave you with this. I want to encourage you to get the book that I wrote called Building Strong Families. We expand on a lot of the stuff we spoke about today extensively. And if you're having challenges in your marriage, then the book is a manual for building strong families. Not just building families, strong families. You can have a family, but if it's a strong family, that's a different matter. You need some tools for that. So I'd encourage you. It's available from our resource center for delivery to you in, in hard uh, copy, or you can get it on Kindle online. And it's not to sell books, it's to build your life. Now, just before you go, one last thing. We want to remind you to get your kids plugged into youth on a Friday night. Youth is fantastic and young adults. Pastor Chris here runs that with his wife Candace and the team and they do a fantastic job. So parents, make sure your kids are tuning in. We're helping you develop them and turn them into Christian leaders in their lives. And you'll really thank God that they plugged into church one day when you see that outworking in their lives. And then lastly, next weekend, we've got Pastor Buddy Crimians from upstate New York, from Albany, speaking to us across our campuses. Make sure you don't miss that. He's such a lovely person, so positive, full of faith, and I think it'll encourage us all. So tune in next week and get to church online so that you can enjoy great ministry. Until then, God bless.